I don't need any wise cracks from my son about not ever seeing me hold a broom before. Um, so we are in this series, um, and we're talking about these great hymns of the faith, songs that have inspired us, have, have stayed with the Christian church for hundreds of years, sometimes even thousands. And uh, we're looking at this song today called Blessed Assurance. And uh, I'm not sure this is as familiar a song as some of the other ones we were doing. Trevor uh, wasn't familiar with it, and he said something about it being much older than he was used to. Um, which I think was his way of reminding me that I am older, much, much older than him. Um, so I appreciate that, Trev. Uh, but uh, in this song, it says, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And one of the, the things I really loved about this uh, particular song is there is a blessed assurance, of course, we understand that, Jesus is mine. But quickly, you'll see many times the older writers will jump in and they'll start piling on the different parts of the Godhead. And so you'll see he talks about a purchase of God, born of his spirit, and washed in his blood. And so that we get the Trinity. We get the picture of the whole Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see things like this and we're like, oh, that's so neat. That's so creative. But of course, they're just grabbing these ideas right, right from the scriptures. And what he's doing here is he's kind of piling on all of these things as to why this having this possession that we have in Jesus is such an incredible gift and such an incredible blessing. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. He's just sort of piling on all of these fantastic things that happen, all of these blessings that God pours out on us. And so Trevor and I are, were talking about uh, this particular hymn, and I was like, you know, what does it remind you of? Is there any, like, a text or a Bible verse? And he's like, well, obviously Ephesians 1. And I was like, yeah, yeah, right, Ephesians 1. And, and then I, and when he left, I went to go look it up. Because <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, Trevor says Ephesians 1. It's got to be Ephesians 1. <laughs> and so I jump in, and I, I find out, I was like, yeah, it actually, it actually feels like that. It feels a lot like Ephesians 1. And so that's going to be our text this morning. And I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible or a digital version of the Bible, open it up because it's, it's a longer text. It's, it's, we're going to go through verses 1 through 14. And I want to kind of bounce around just a little bit uh, as we kind of look at this, uh, this uh, passage here. And you'll see it has a lot of the same themes as this song, Blessed Assurance, which to me really captures a part of the Christian experience that I think is often neglected. We often want to know what we're supposed to do and, and, and what sin we're supposed to battle. And we want to talk about, you know, some of the harder teachings of the scriptures and, and kind of feel, you know, how we can peel them out apart. And, and those are all very, very important. And there's lots of, like, sin lists and things we need to avoid. And there's ways of living in this world and sacrificial kind of giving. And the parables of Jesus are all super challenging. But then every once in a while, you come across a text like this. And this doesn't, it doesn't get us to that place that says, now listen, be a better person or live in this way. And it isn't a, a series of commands that make us think, wow, I have to like really kind of double down and, you know, and kind of get going on this thing. But instead, it, it draws our attention back to the, the reason that we do all of what we do. And, and when the writers do this, they often just start piling on as if they can't contain themselves anymore. And they just start grabbing every thought and every idea and they kind of pile them all up. And it's meant to, in a way, wash over us. To sort of overflow the bounds of the language itself and create in us an experience, a sense, you could even say, of who God is. And that's really what this text is about. So starting in verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace. 
to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that might just sound like a regular greeting, and of course it is a regular greeting, but you will often find little hints in the openings or the closings of some of these epistles, especially the openings, that will give you a sense as to where you're going. They, they, they switch out a few words here and there and customize it to the audience that they were writing to. And in this case, uh, we get this first line where he says, to God's holy people, and this is the word for saint. And so right out of the gate, you could say, well, that's neat, doesn't apply to me, because, you know, the saints are the super Christians. Those are the really, really good Christians. Or if you come from a background like mine, the saints are the statues that we pray to or we bury upside down or anything like that, like in our backyard if you got to sell your house. But, you know, those are the saints. But when you get into the scriptures, you find out that that's not how God uses the word saint. The word itself means the holy one, like it's translated here, but it actually has to do with, with us being set apart by God. And he calls people saints who aren't living very saintly. So this is more than just a call to action. And it certainly isn't a criticism to say, look, you guys are all just lousy people and there are some Christians that are really, really good. And you should be like them. This is a statement of who you are in Jesus. That you are set apart by God for God. It's a part of your identity. Whether you live that way or not is a different question. But you are no mere mortal. You're a saint, a holy one, set apart by the all-powerful and kind and loving Savior. Grace and peace. By the way, if you were to read the rest of Ephesians, those are the themes. Grace and peace. There is a gift that God is giving to you, and it creates for you a settled confidence, a peace, a connection. This word for peace, it, it, it's more than just simply this idea of like no hostility or no war. It, it has to do with things being right, being the way it ought to be. And so we are at peace because we are, in fact, in right relationship to our creator through grace. And so anyway, that's just his introduction. That's not actually the part I want to focus on. The part I want to really focus on starts in verse 3. And from here on out, from verse 3 all the way down to 14, in the Greek, the scholars like to point out that it's actually one long sentence, which some scholars look at and they go, that's a ridiculously long sentence. This is the worst possible grammar you could ever have wanted, and this is so butchered, and how could they do this? And others look at it and they go, that isn't what I see. I see this beautiful and intricate and very, very long sentence with no breaks, no, no apparent place where you would expect a punctuation mark to be put in. Instead, it is just this long, flowing, building sort of a, of a text all wrapped up in one sentence because it captures one great idea with a whole lot of different threads. And so I'm thinking about this, and I was like, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty cool, because like Cheryl and I just went away. We, went, we spent a few days up in Cape Cod, like, which is great. We got back like, really just in time, uh, which is nice. And so we got, but while we were driving up there, it was my turn to drive, which means my turn to pick music. So we switched from whatever country music I think she was listening to at the time, and we switched to classic rock. And one of the first songs that came on was Stairway to Heaven, which, you know, is, she said, and it was, it was low, it was kind of, you know, it's slow. It starts very, very slow. And I was like, you know, we were looking for upbeat music because I'm driving and I, I, get, I get sleepy when I drive. And so I wanted something with a little bit more punch. And so Stairway to Heaven goes on. She's like, oh, you want me to change it? I'm like, no. That's like a, like, that's like a cardinal sin. Like, I don't, that might be close to the unforgivable sin. If ever Stairway to Heaven comes on, you must hear it through to the end. And I was like, you know, I don't remember it being so slow. It is a little slow. Like, I'm a little, and then, of course, it just builds, and it builds, and it builds, and it ends in this amazing crescendo. And some of you are like, what is he even talking about? The Stairway, anyway, look, listen to it. It, it. Anyway, builds. And people talk about this text, scholars talk about it like that, like a snowball that starts small at the top of a mountain. And it starts to roll down the mountain. And it starts to kind of build and get larger and larger until at the end it's just this massive thing that you, have to, you can't get around. You have to see it and you have to experience it. And, it's just this, and it kind of builds in this incredible crescendo. 
and what it builds to is essential for us. Let's read it here together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. He starts the whole of his message with this idea that we are to praise God. And the reason he gives is because of how unbelievable the blessings of God are that he has poured out on you, which I'm not really sure is the dominant way most people experience their faith. Recently, I was able to talk with some of our blessed people, you know, our neighbors, our friends that uh, we've had a relationship with for many, many years, and uh, the conversation turned, as it often does, to faith. And I'm reflecting on it. And afterwards, I was like, you know, I, I don't know that I captured any sense of this part of the gospel story. You know, I was, I was talking about the reliability of the scriptures and I was talking about other important things and I was talking about, you know, the salvation that we find in Jesus and what the cross was about. And these are all super important things. But this idea of how God just continues to pour out these blessings upon us time and again, I was like, wow, I just, I missed it. We talked for hours and I missed this idea. Wow. I just don't think it's hardwired into us as much. I think most of us come from a background where God's harshness or his judgment or his justice dominates. I know that's how, how it was for me growing up. I was originally raised in a, in a Catholic background. And then we went to some Pentecostal churches where the dominant idea was largely you're not, you're not quite living good enough and you got to work real hard and you got to like be better and you know, maybe you're saved today and maybe you're not. You know, it depends on whether or not, you know, you've, you've uh, you know, been good enough this week. And so there was a lot of insecurity in that relationship with God. And it seemed like he was always waiting to judge, always waiting to kind of bring the hammer down on us. And so it reminded me that uh, there were so many, many, many years ago, my brother, he was like, I guess, 17, 18. He had just started driving. And he, uh, He's a big guy. My brother's like 10 years older than me. I think he's got to be like 60. I think he just celebrated his 60th. And uh, he's a big guy. He's like 6'3", you know, at the time, and like 220 pounds, and it's all muscle, and he's just a big guy. And, uh, and he's my half-brother. Um, and so <laughs> I, I knew that you were thinking that. And, and so uh, anyway, it, it, he, he's my, my, my brother is a real fun guy, and he's got a great sense of humor and great wit. And he was also the good kid. Like he would, would, you know, always very obedient and, you know, very compliant and that kind of a thing. And, and uh, one day, anyway, he had mouthed off. And in, my, in, in our world, if you mouthed off, you said something that my mom didn't like, you were instantly slapped, like, psh, like right there in front of your friends. It didn't matter. There was no, like, you would just, psh, like, you know, you use that mouth like that, psh, there it is, a slap across the face. And so, like, it was a pretty normal kind of a thing. And, uh, well, anyway, one day... Uh, he had said something to my mother, and, and she didn't like it, and so she slapped him. Probably, you know, slapped him on the arm because she was a shorter woman. And uh, slapped him on the arm or whatever, and he goes, ooh, it stings like a bee. 
because, you know, he's a big dude. Like, she, she couldn't actually hurt him. And so, but he, now instead of saying, oh, man, I'm so sorry, oh, oh you know, like, getting whacked, instead he acts like a big, you know, he's 17, 18, he's macho now. Well, anyway, he had spent years and money restoring a 57 Chevy. And I don't know if any of you know the 57 Chevy. The classic version of it was black with a little white tail fin. And it's a gorgeous vehicle. Big old engine. He was, you know, it was his pride and joy. And so my mom, she's like, stings like a bee, huh? And she goes over to the closet and she grabs a broom. And she walks right past him to the car and starts wailing on it. Hitting the 57 Chevy, and he sees what's happening now. He runs out there and he stands in between her and the car. And he's like, Hit me, hit me, you know, because like this is justice, you know, and this is a kind of a judgment. Some of you are like, You know, I really wish we'd have gotten to meet his mom. I wish you could have too. It would explain so much. You guys would be like, Oh, now I kind of get it. And she was, a, my mother was a firecracker of a woman, and so taking a broom to a car would be a normal kind of an occurrence there. The idea that God's holding a broom, waiting for you to mouth off, waiting for you to screw up. It's a normal part of the way we mostly understand God. And yet we get into this text and there is this beautiful language about who God is and his lavish blessings that he pours out on us. I mean, he, take, take a look at a couple of these ideas, right? He says, who has blessed us, this is verse 3, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. Now this idea has to do not with like heaven up there or like well, the opposite of earth or anything like this. The heavenly realms has to do with all things in the spirit realm. And so what we see this text doing is it's transitioning our focus from the things that are important to us here on earth to the things that are important in the unseen world. And so there's a transition that's happening throughout this whole passage because in the Old Testament, God mostly showed his blessings in very real and tangible and physical ways. Property, land, children. And you would understand that you had received God's blessing. But now the shift has been going on. He's saying, listen, this isn't about the material things. Those were, those were more like placeholders to teach you. You know how you, when you work with your kids, like you, you know, you have a little kid and all of a sudden you're just, you know, my mother was also great at like just lavishing love on us. Just she, she was so generous with it. And so if we needed, wanted something, it was ours. Like, you know, you wanted a toy, it was yours. So she did everything in her power to get you something that you would want. And so if you saw a toy and my mother knew that you wanted that toy, she would give it to you because she knew that that was a, that was a way of loving you. And as a kid, that's how you understand love. Right? Like if you don't give a kid a toy when they want a toy, they feel like you don't love them, that you don't like them because they're kids and that's, that's the way they understand the world. And so you give them just a little bit of kindness and you give them something that their heart really longs for and you do as much of that as you can as a parent because you know that's actually how they understand love. Well, in a similar way, in the scriptures, there was a maturing of this picture so that now everything in the heavenly realms is starting to come into focus. And we're starting to see that many of those blessings, which we're still promised to, to some degree, you know, Jesus still says, you don't have to worry about food and clothing and stuff like that. And I'm going to give you family and, you know, I'm building a, a home for you in heaven. And he still talks in these very tangible ways. But the blessings now take a decidedly spiritual and deeper turn, more important turn. So he says to us, blessed in the heavenly realms, and here's this key idea, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And everything that follows is an attempt by Paul to start to pull out and explain to us what it looks like, what a taste of every blessing is. And one of the great questions you can ask yourself is, do my, does my understanding of blessing line up with Paul's understanding of blessing? Or am I still wrapped up in more childlike ways of seeing God's blessing, of understanding it. Because as we move into Christian maturity, to align our hearts and our minds with what Jesus tells us is essential. So here's a couple of them. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy 
and blameless. Interestingly, you know, we talk about us being chosen by God and the predestination. That's all here in this passage. I don't think I'm going to get to it, but we'll see. And, but the, the point of it is here that he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. Being holy and blameless is part of the blessing. Right? How often when we think about the thing that, uh, that God wants from us, and if it's some sort of restriction of our freedom, if it's some sort of uh, you know, coming around to live in a different way or to get rid of certain things in our lives, we think of them as like the hardships of the Christian faith. But the truth of the matter is those are part of the blessing. He chose us to be holy and to be blameless. And when we are holy and blameless, guess what it does? It blesses you. That's a promise from Jesus. And it's how you, of course, become a blessing to others. Your blamelessness, your holiness, your set-apartness, your sacredness becomes sacred to other people. And you know how Jesus, he walked up and he would, he would touch, you know, people that were sick and, and things that were unclean in the ceremonial sense and lepers and you know, everyone in, in that day was scared to touch any of those things because the, 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 the unclean things made you dirty. And so you wouldn't touch him. And then Jesus comes on the scene. He's like, no, 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 no. The sanctity, the, the holiness of you brings holiness to them. That's how this transfer goes. You get to take that holiness and that blamelessness and you get to bring that into your relationships each and every day. And then he goes on. He predestined us for adoption to sonship. One of the most beautiful pictures in all the scriptures, this language, we talked about it last week. It's the son of God, Jesus, the son of God. And an exchange was being made where he said, I am going to take my son and I'm going to use his sacrifice to make you my children, my sons and my daughters. You know, people look at it and they're like, I don't understand how Jesus could do such a thing. Well, because you are his children. That's how he sees you. You're, 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 you're an heir with him. We look at these ideas and we think, how is it that the king of the universe, the creator of everything, can call us his children? And we're like, you know, I don't know. I don't understand it. And yet... He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. I don't think we often reflect on this reality. God is pleased. He's, he takes great pleasure in lavishing blessings upon us. He pours them out. And when he pours out blessings and when he calls us from before eternity and when he, and when he, yeah, when he pours out wrath on sin through Christ. There is some pleasure in the Godhead in that. How could that be? Because of what it's accomplishing for you. Some great and incredible blessing poured out in accordance with his pleasure and will. Imagine if we could live every day knowing that the receiving of God's blessings puts a smile on our God's face. That, that the way that God experiences us and this world isn't simply with frustration and anger or anything like that, but with pleasure, with delight in the Godhead, with singing and celebration, the way that we would experience pleasure. There are hints as to what we can imagine going on to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. And you'll notice this kind of language over and over again. His pleasure that he's freely given us. In him, we have redemption through his blood. We spoke a lot about that in previous weeks. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. The richness of his grace. Grace is this idea of a free gift. You don't deserve it, and yet God just continues to pour it out on us. He can't get enough of it. It's like he can't help himself. This whole long line, this big giant run-on sentence that keeps piling on all of these different ideas, 
It keeps going back to this idea of God's free gift that he's giving to us. His grace is this incredible gift that he lavished on us, which I can't, you just can't get enough of that word like that. That he lavished on us. We wake up in the morning, do we feel like this is another day where the creator of the universe is going to lavish his blessings upon you? We get so wrapped up. We're thinking about, you know, the anxiety and the jobs and the, now the storm. And I think it's going to have power. And what am I going to do? Is there going to be gas? And oh, I should have gotten toilet paper because I think there was a problem with toilet paper back then. You know, so we have all of these things. And that's where we spend so much of our, 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 our head space is spent in all of these, the cares of this world and what we think are the blessings. And here God is telling us, I, every day I am just lavishing blessings upon you. It brings him great joy to do it. To lavish these blessings on you with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. This idea for mystery, it's a good word because the mystery that Paul regularly talks about is really, it's, it's, it is the gospel message. It is the fact that God was in Christ reconciling us to him. That's part of the mystery, but it's even more than that. The mystery here is that God is reconciling all things in Christ. And so the actual physical world, the earth and the heaven, they're all being integrated in Christ. This, these heavenly places that he speaks of, that spiritual realm where this whole thing started, He's integrating that into our current existence. And he's telling us that it's going to be extended from here into all of eternity. There is a great mystery and somehow at the center of it is Christ. One of the things that, that really did uh, stand out in that conversation I had with my neighbors was I, I was able to do one thing pretty good. And that was keep the focus on Christ, right? He must become greater, we must become lesser. And and time and again, I was able to just continue to remind my friends that the reason that Christians seem so obsessed with Jesus is because we're obsessed with Jesus. You read a text like this and just go through and circle every time it says Jesus or Christ or him or the one. It, there's just a, more than a dozen places because it's so, it's so Christocentric. It, you can't get away from, from what it is we learn about God through Christ and what we have received in God, in not only here on earth, but in all of the heavenly realms, what we have received because of Christ. And so just to continue to point the picture back to Christ and to say, listen, he is in fact, yes, we're Christ-centered Christ, we're, we're Christ -centered on these things because when, when you understand what Christ did for you, and here again, we just see it time and again, the mystery of all of these things, right? Of his will, according to his good pleasure, there's the pleasure again, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And he says, in him we were chosen. This is verse 11. Having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with his purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. If you notice down at the end of that section in verse 14, he ends the whole of this section with to the praise of his glory. And so a few times he mentions this, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. And so he wraps all of these ideas up to the praise of his glory because he understands that if we in fact start to, to dive deep into the blessings that God has poured out on us in Christ, there's only one natural response. It will be us to praise his glory. Why is it that Christians talk so much about God and why is it that we can't, you know, we can't help have a conversation and try to bring the thing around to, to talk about Jesus and because it's to the praise of his glory. Because if you understood what it is that God is trying to do and how he's, he's calling. This is why I felt so odd that I hadn't, hadn't even talked about this in, in, in an hour, two hour long conversation. Because it's like, this is to the praise of his glory. Like if you understood this, it would stir your heart toward knowing and loving him and pursuing him and becoming the kind. Yeah, we would deal with all of the other things about holiness and sanctification and all that. And, and becoming the kinds of men and women that Jesus wants us to be. But it's rooted in his blessings being poured out on us in this 
lavish sort of a way that just erupts and it comes, it, it overflows it ba- its bounds. It starts as a little snowball and it just continues to build and build and build and then it meets this giant crescendo. He says, you were marked in him. Look at this in verse 13. You, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. In the Old Testament, Israel was the one called God's possession. And so what Paul is doing here is pretty profound. It's pretty astounding to his audience because he's saying, listen, it's not simply ancient Israel that was God's possession, but it's, it's all of you who have been chosen in Christ who have been called out of the world and set apart as his holy ones, you're God's possession. You're his inheritance. You are the thing that he has been working toward. He has been gathering all of us up and he has been putting us in the land. We are this great inheritance. And one of the words that's used here, this idea of a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, it's, it was used, it still is used, as a word to, to talk about like an engagement ring, right? And so the engagement ring is the promise of the marriage. And so what he's telling us here is that you're a deposit who is a deposit. The Holy Spirit is in us, right? This is the whole Trinity thing that we were talking about. It is the Holy Spirit who is the deposit guaranteeing it. And so God comes along, he puts... Through Christ, he redeems you. And he puts a seal upon you, like you were being branded, right? An animal would have been branded to to claim ownership, right? You would would have marked your possessions with this sort of a brand. And that brand is like, he's saying, this is not an outward brand. This is an inward brand in your soul, in your heart. You're being branded with the Holy Spirit. You're being marked. You're being sealed. And that mark, that seal is like a promissory note. It's like an engagement ring. He's saying, listen, this is where we're heading. I'm guaranteeing it. This is a promise that I am making to you. The king of the universe promising your future marriage to him. It's it's just lavishing his blessing, guaranteeing it. All to the praise of his glory. I wonder sometimes if we spent more of our time in reflection and on meditation, our time pursuing our Christian faith and our Christian growth. You know, we spent more of it thinking about these promises. Not simply you know, how we're going to clean ourselves up and how we're going to work harder and how we're going to do better, but we simply rest in this awesome promise of the king of the universe that you are desperately loved, that you are a saint in his kingdom, that you have been pursued through the ages, that he has lavished upon you blessing upon blessing, things that make the blessings of this world pale in comparison Not a a house or a car or money or a retirement that's going to last you a few decades, but an inheritance in heaven. He's promising you an engagement ring because we're told that to be with God is like it's the marriage supper of the lamb. And so Jesus comes on the scene and he turns water into wine and he shows what a party is really going to be like. And he says there's going to come a day where the bridegroom is coming back, where the groom is going to come back and he's going to find his engaged bride and she is going to be ready because she has been marked with a seal the promised holy spirit and we trim our wicks as another parable tells us and we await the coming of of jesus and when that day comes he will receive each and every one of us into his father's house where he has been busy building an addition for us so that we might one day be with him in this heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm, where every blessing is freely and graciously and lavishly poured out on me and on you.